Welcome to episode 192 of the CU Insight Experience. I'm Randy Smith, one of the co-founders of CUinsight.com, and this show is all about taking a deep dive with the leaders of the credit union movement that make it so great. This episode is brought to you by Valera, formerly PSCU Co-op Solutions, the nation's premier payments credit union service organization in it integrated financial technology solutions provider. Valera serves more than 4,000 financial institutions throughout North America, operating with velocity to help its clients keep pace with the rapid momentum of change and fuel growth in a new era of financial services. They also have a longtime partner and supporter of this show, so we thank them. Check them out in the show notes. From time to time, we have somebody from outside of credit unions to share their knowledge and perspective. And today is one of those shows. I am having a conversation with Pamela Barnum. Pamela is a trust strategist and body language expert. She's a former police officer and a federal prosecuting attorney. And she is also, which we are extremely excited about, the next keynote at, at the upcoming CU Insight Minicon event. So with that, we will link to everything about Pamela in the show notes. But Pamela, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to talk to you. Well, thank you, Randy. Thanks for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Uh, me too. For those who haven't uh, done the deep dive on your website and your TED Talk and, and things like that, could you give us a little bit of background for our listeners, where your career started and, and how it took you to where you are today? Absolutely. I started out as a uniform police officer 30 years ago. I can't believe it's been that long. And within a, <laughs> within a few years... I was recruited into the drug enforcement section. I loved the drug work, the criminal work. I wrote a lot of search warrants. So I was invited into that unit where I spent a decade working deep undercover. So I would live in a different town, different background, et cetera, 10 to 12 months at a time, did that for a decade, loved it. Great job. Then I met someone working undercover. He wasn't a drug dealer. He was uh, another police <laughs> officer. We we call it our government prearranged marriage because we had to pretend to be married and live together. Well, of course, one thing leads to another. We end up actually getting married. And, you know, 20 something years later, we're still married. How often does that happen? Like you're you're <laughs> deep in that situation. Is that a common thing? <laughs> no, I would think it's pretty rare because I was the only yeah. woman in a unit of uh, 92 specialized officers. So that was great. And we started a family. It's tough to buy crack and heroin as a mom. You know, it's a tough thing to explain to the other moms. So <laughs> I was finishing law school and I was very fortunate because my expertise and background led me to the prosecutor's office. Uh, where I had a very exciting and interesting career as a federal prosecutor. And now I tour around and I get to speak to incredible people like your audience, uh, either live or virtually, presenting things about trust and leadership and the dynamics around how to communicate, how to negotiate. So who knows what career I'll have when I'm in my you know 60s, 70s, and 80s. Maybe <laughs> it'll change. We never know, but I'm loving it. Keeps it exciting. You know, before we jump into the topics that, that you're going to cover in your keynote, I saw your TEDx talk when I was, like I said, doing a little homework for the show. And it just, I had to ask, it's the title, but like, what did drug dealers teach you about trust? <laughs> well, a lot of things, actually, you know, it's interesting because we think about, you know, CEOs, for example, of credit unions, or we think of teachers or doctors, lawyers, drug dealers, stay-at-home parents. Really, everyone is the same deep down. We all have these human flaws. We have this human need to feel like we belong. We have our own set of values. You know, people often think drug dealers, bikers, criminals don't have values. They do. They just don't necessarily align with the way we see justice, for example. They have a very strong sense of justice, but it's often very different than maybe how you or I would think about justice. So right. it, there, when we look at people's innermost values, they trust is foundational to everything. People, when I show up as an undercover officer, clearly I don't announce, hey, I'm an undercover drug cop. I start out street level doing, you know, going to places where I know they're going to be, getting to know people. And I have to get them to trust me because they are doing something that they don't like to advertise. So right. getting that trust is so important. And how we do that, you know, in that scenario is exactly the same as how we would do it when we're getting our customers, our members you know, if we're part of a credit union, our membership to trust us and to, you know, want to connect with us and be a part of what we're offering. So trust is, is that basic human need and uh, that, foundation for everything. 
that makes a lot of sense because we talk a lot about trust, obviously, and credit unions with people are entrusting us with their their money, their financial future, right? At Minicon, I, I know the focus of the keynote is going to be on tactical influence. So just a couple of quick questions. We don't want to give it all away because we want people to, to, to come. I'm sure they're going to enjoy it. But my guess is after the conversation, people will want more. So first, what does tactical influence mean? And, and why do you, I, I love the term superpower, but why do you use it as, you know, view it as a superpower for leaders? I view it as a superpower because it takes people. So we think about leaders who we often hear presentations about who can rise to a challenge, who are resilient. But I believe with tactical influence that we take it a step further and we go to a place where that superpower allows us to be the kind of leader who did the thing, not just who can rise to do it, but who actually did it. And there's lots of acronyms, and I've been doing a deep dive into research about tactical influence, and I fine tune it. But of course, like most organizations, I do have acronyms. And I think about this as being, you know, first principles of leadership when we think of tactical influence. So there's the first is the acronym. So F is fortitude. You know, resilient leaders can suffer through all sorts of change and setbacks. And I don't think that there is a human being on the planet who has not gone through change and transition. It seems like we wake up every day and there is a new challenge presented to us that we need to go through. So we have these unforeseen setbacks, but the secret to navigating those unseen difficulties lies in our ability to deliberately do and embrace hard things. So I'm going to talk about the Fortitude Four uh, at the Minicon. We're going to go through some strategies around how to really embrace it because, you know, embracing the suck really is not fun. You can look back at your own life and think about what are the things I did that were really hard? I didn't want to do it. And I did it anyway. And now I'm a better leader because of that. My team wants to follow me because they see that. So what are some easy things? Uh, I guess easy is the wrong word. Some simple strategies that we can put into place. So the Fortitude Four, we're going to go through that. I look forward to that for sure. When I was thinking about this conversation, so many of the previous CEOs who have been on this show over the years always talk about communication. It is being like that key thing. It takes communication, you know, throughout the whole organization, especially when you're talking about change or difficult times. We all know that some people are better at it than others, <laughs> right? I, I want to flip this kind of backwards before forwards, I guess you could say, but kind of take the negative. Is there a mistake that you see leaders repeatedly make when they're communicating with their, their teams? Oh, absolutely. That That is the the I in the first principle. So in the acronym we have fortitude, I is insight. We think, you know, there was a study done of 5,000 executives, so people in the C-suite of all sorts of different organizations, and they interviewed them to see how they saw themselves. What's their self-awareness, essentially? And over 90% rated themselves very highly as being very self-aware. They they know what their values are. They think they know how to communicate them, all of those types of things. Then they did 360s on those people. And they found that fewer than 20% other people actually saw those things in them. So self-awareness, insight goes much deeper than we think. We all like to think we're there, but oftentimes we're not really cluing in. So I want to give people strategies that when we show up, it's not, the words are easy. We can all memorize the terms, the words, whether we're negotiating uh, in our businesses, whether we're speaking to new employees, whatever that looks like, but how are they seeing it? So there are very simple things to look for in nonverbals that will provide us with feedback and allow us to have a deeper insight into not only how we see ourselves, but how what are we doing to present that? If we think of ourselves as having a high degree of integrity and we show up late for a meeting or unprepared, that nonverbal signal is sending a very different message to those people. So we may think, okay, we're, you know, and who knows what happened? We got a call from our child's school, something has happened and that's led to that. But without communicating in a way that demonstrates what those values are, I think we are very challenged to uh, have that insight that's required. Is there a communication style or traits that the best leaders you've worked with have? 
Absolutely. One, of course, is that intense listening, We the power listening skills. We Again, I think we all make mistakes at this world. We all think we're great at it. We're great listeners. But do we catch ourselves cutting somebody off? Or I'm a lawyer. I'm thinking when you're speaking, I'm thinking, what am I going to ask next? How do I get that person into the place I need them to be as a cross-examining them? So our brains just work that way. We, we want to be a step ahead. That's human nature. But how can we take a pause and just actually listen? If we're listening and watching, which is very, very difficult, that's why in interrogations and policing, we have two officers in the room, one oftentimes, or two as part of the interview, one can be watching from a camera somewhere else, but there's always more than one. So we're listening for the words, but we need to be watching how someone is saying those words, because it can be very out of alignment. I'll give people some strategies, including my number one undercover technique on how to build that rapport and connection that will establish trust, even in the most challenging, difficult circumstances. Boy, now I've got about 10 different questions, but uh, <laughs> I have to. it's my favorite part of the podcast is I just sometimes right. go down rabbit holes. But I think it's it, because I do think it's so interesting. I know for myself, I've struggled with it. Maybe I was supposed to be a lawyer at some point, but you know, where I'm always... Oh, I have something to say and, you know, s- slowing it down. And I have a friend who's really good at it. And I think some people think he speaks slower. It's like, no, he listens till everybody's done talking before he says anything, right? Like, and it's always thoughtful. That's something I've tried to work on. So you're resonating with me there for sure. But I noticed one of the, the, the questions that I wrote down was that I noticed that you use words like fearless and confidence along with empathy at work. Any tips on, I guess, being fearless and being confident, but also, you know, creating a high empathy environment. And my, my guess is just from how long you said that you were kind of in the work environment, we're probably a similar age group. I, I think a lot of the books we grew up reading weren't necessarily by the most empathetic leaders. I'm doing air quotes there. Uh, but, but we live in a different world today, correct? So I guess any tips that you have for our listeners on that? Oh, absolutely. Trust exists at the crossroads of confidence and empathy. Too much of one, not enough of the other. We're going to run into some challenges. My second TEDx talk was something about undercover work and empathy. I forget the exact title that they used, but how what an undercover cop learned about empathy or something along those lines. And here's an example. When we are speaking with someone, listening, of course, expresses empathy, but so does our open body language, for example, not closing down. And we're all much more comfortable oftentimes having our arms crossed or standing in a way that's more protective. And that's fine. Or some people have a bad back. Some people are cold. There's a million reasons why we do that. But survey after survey shows that people feel that when someone is closing their body language, that they're somehow closed off, even if they don't recognize it in the moment. So it serves us if we can try to remain more open. The same with our expressions, leaning in, having a neutral face. All of these things express empathy, but nothing expresses empathy more than actually listening to someone and hearing what their words are and coming back. You know, maybe people have heard this idea that when someone has said something to you, you would say something along the lines of, so what I'm hearing is, what I'm seeing the issue is, blah, blah, blah. When we take that personal pronoun, I, and put that into the mix. Oftentimes what people are hearing is, oh, now she's making it all about her. Now it's all about her. She's not, she's regurgitating what I said, but it's all about her. Instead, if we do a slight shift with something along the lines of, it sounds like, it feels like, it seems like, whatever that is, now we're keeping the focus on the issue at hand or whatever it is that we're discussing. Or someone can even interpret that about and making it about themselves. But that's up to them. If we say something like, you seem to be saying, now it's more accusatory. So right. language really makes a big difference. Just small little shifts. We're probably doing all of the other things very well. And we know what we're talking about. We have excellence in our and competence. 
but how we relay that to people matters, how they hear it. And again, culturally sensitive, right? Uh, you know, credit unions deal with people from all sorts of backgrounds, new Americans, people who have been there a long time, people who are in more rural, people who are in more urban. So we have a lot of different personalities, a lot of different backgrounds to think about. And some of the things don't translate well. You know, for example, eye contact. Eye contact can be seen as very empathetic. But in some cultures, when people are coming from places where it is seen as more disrespectful. So having an understanding of the person that you're dealing with in that moment is so important. And we all make it about ourselves. We can't help it. We're human beings. And that's just who we are. That That's human nature. But if we take a step back, for example, do a little bit of research before that person is before us, or even if they aren't, asking a couple of easy questions will give us that type of background. Let me ask you this. Most of the listeners to the podcast tend to be leaders in the credit union space already. So I think there's so much, obviously, from a leadership perspective that you're talking about that is going to resonate with our listeners. But also, are there resources or tips or tools that you recommend? Because we also have frontline staffs who are dealing with our members every day. And just like what you were talking about, the diversity of members is is great in the different situations. Is there anything that you recommend for those people who are dealing with the members of the credit union on a day to day basis? Sometimes in the leadership positions, you're not seeing them every day, right? So it's uh, that that you recommend as far as training goes to make sure we're creating a an empathetic environment for our members as well? Absolutely. And that definitely starts with the leadership of each credit union, because if your frontline staff feel that you hear them, you see them, you acknowledge that they're working, that's going to translate. If they feel that somehow they are being micromanaged or that any, if they step out of line in any way or say the wrong thing, it's going to result in, you know, chaos all around them. They're, ability to provide the best service to the membership is going to be challenged. So it starts with the leaders. I recommend that people do a quick check-in. So I don't know exactly which each branch, what it looks like when people show up in the mornings, but perhaps a quick check-in, an acknowledgement, letting people know you appreciate them. Can you imagine if your boss came in and just said, you know what, I've noticed that you're doing an incredible job. I know you've, there's been challenges uh, at home and understanding where people have some challenges is, is appreciated as well. And I really appreciate the fact that you still show up with a smile or you still take time to listen to Mrs. Smith's story about her cat or whatever it is that people are doing and let them know that they have the time to do that and that you appreciate that and you see it because we're really quick to give people feedback when they're screwing things up. That's again, right. human nature. Yeah. We can't help it. But to just go out of your way or to have small little things, you know, understanding there was a book written years ago about love languages or something. I remember reading it briefly. Yep. You know, some people, <laughs> some people want to have little gifts. Some people want to have experiences. Some people want to be told the words of, of appreciation, whatever that is. Having an understanding of your staff and where they're at in that type of thing is great. Some people, sure, they love the words, but hey, a little, a $5 gift card to the coffee shop just to say, it goes way further with them. Whereas the next person, they want to go out for lunch with the boss one time because that would be huge for them. So whatever that is understanding those people, that's going to show up in how they in turn front themselves to the membership. You know, this is a question that I've asked to different people on the podcast. And I thought it it's not one that I ask all the time, but I thought it fit here. Like so often, and when you're working with organizations, I'm sure you see this, you know, when it comes to let's say, a strategic plan. The things that we measure, we tend to accomplish. For the leader who's listening today or comes to Minicon and they're like, we want to do better. Is this something that can be measured? Is this something that you know you could say, okay, is it member service scores or something of that nature where it's like, okay, we're doing a better job today than we were 12 months ago and listening better, quite honestly? I think there is. I think that probably they're getting feedback from membership. And it depends if, if they are sending out surveys or if they have discussions with people. But at the very least, oftentimes, they're, they're going to hear about when someone is unhappy. So is that happening more often? Is that happening less often? And the same thing for our staff. What is it like for them? I think being really honest, and leaders are great 
at saying, you know what, my door is always open. I hear what you're saying. But putting that into practice looks very, very differently. So let's say, for example, we were going to have a staff meeting, we were going to uh, get together. When the leader says, I always have an open door policy, and I want to hear what you think. A great thing to do is for them to give an example of where they are working on themselves. So for example, you know, it could be, you know, I want to ensure that I'm available, but oftentimes, you know, my schedule is is over here, but from now on moving forward, every second Thursday from this time to this time, you can come in and see me and we can have a discussion around whatever it is that is a challenge or you have recommendations to make the workplace more inclusive or more exciting or fun or whatever it is that you're looking to accomplish. I think that that is a good thing. Not only saying it, but actually literally doing it is where the magic happens. I like that. That like actually giving it the place on the calendar to, to it's not just like my door is open unless I'm on the phone or whatever. Right? Like, <laughs> like, and we're all busy. And we're all that's busy. Why, right? Yeah, full calendar. That's why they're CEOs. They're successful. <laughs> right? They're busy. They have a lot going on. And, you know, I only speak for myself, but sometimes the last thing I want to do is hear from someone who's complaining about something or someone who has an issue. So, you know, we can even put a structure to it. It's like, I want to hear the challenge. But when you come in, I want you to have at least one solution or one idea that can change that. So what does that that. look like? Then people are like, okay, I'm not just going to complain that the coffee's not great. I'm going to like make a recommendation about whatever, you know, just an easy example. It's that idea of uh, you can poke holes, but how about, you know, some advice on how to fill it to or an idea? Absolutely. Right? So, uh, you know, one more question before we kind of move on to more of the leadership stuff. But one of the, the many things I love about hosting this podcast is, you know, getting to pick the brains of a lot of people, a lot of smart people like you. I heard this question a couple of years ago on another podcast and I absolutely loved it. But it was, what's the greatest investment? that you've made in your career. Uh, the, the example on that podcast was Warren Buffett saying Dale Carnegie courses. Oh, so if, yes. you, if, if you think back over your career, m- different professions uh, along the way, as, as you mentioned in the beginning, like, is there an investment that you made in, in yourself in your career that you think has been the most helpful? Oh, absolutely. There's never been a personal growth or personal development podcast or course or book that I've ever read that went to waste. They all layer. <laughs> but I would say that one thing that to me is critically important is energy, physical energy, especially. People don't often give enough time and space to great sleep, having a physical routine that can just be a going for a walk. Work is so much easier. Our brain is so much more uh, available to us and our thought processes when we are healthy. And that seems to be the one thing that I see the most people, including myself, when I'm traveling to speak, I, you know, I speak at, you know, (laughs) over 50 different engagements a year, which for me is, you know, a day of flight and here and hotels all around (laughs) it. I do not want to go to the hotel gym or eat a salad. I want a cheeseburger and French fries, and I want to lay in my room and watch HGTV or whatever until it's time. (laughs) But if I do that, I'm not as good at my job, and I don't sleep as well. I don't feel as well. So making those little shifts, and they can be small. It can simply be going for a walk, and instead of the cheeseburger ordering, you know, the salmon or something yeah. along those lines, just small things. But oftentimes, I, I don't hear as many, you know, you take a look at Steve Jobs, for example, probably one of the people that get quoted as being the most successful of all time in, in his area. But his personal life with his oh, yeah. child and spouse, yeah. not not great. <laughs> um, he, people didn't necessarily like him, which yeah. I don't think mattered to him in that position. But his health, yeah, He died oh, in his 50s. And there are sometimes yeah. things we can't control. I'm not saying he could have changed it with a salad. I'm just saying <laughs> it, it didn't appear that that was a priority. And, yeah. and so often, I think if we forget about that, including time off, people love their careers. 
people uh, listening to this yep. podcast, they're passionate about their careers. They wouldn't be where they are. They wouldn't be listening to a podcast. <laughs> right. If, a credit union podcast. The, if, if, they weren't passionate, weren't, right. <laughs> if they weren't passionate, which is great. But sometimes we're even more passionate if we just take a little break. And then we come back even more refreshed. That's why on Mondays, we're ready to go. You know, by Friday afternoon, we're depleted. We just need that recharge time. A question I wanted to ask, you've worked with a lot of people, you, you speak to a lot, you know, a lot of different groups in many different industries. This kind of goes back to what I was saying about some of the CEOs that we grew up with might not necessarily be the examples we want to follow today. What do you think makes a great CEO today or, or maybe even just a leader in general? Uh, self-awareness, I would think, is the number one thing because when we have that, and it's not just self-awareness about what we're thinking inside. It's situational awareness. We can't have self-awareness without situational awareness. So when we are perhaps in a time where the economy is all over the place and people are coming to us because they're afraid, they're concerned, they're nervous, whatever it is, then to have that situational awareness, each answer is going to be different oftentimes based on what's happening. And Obviously, the members are going to have different situations. Some are going to be doing very, very well and others not quite as well. So we cannot have that self-awareness, but how we're presenting ourselves, how the, the messaging we're decoding back without situational awareness. So those are the top two things. Self-awareness, situational awareness will make all the difference because when we have a grasp on those two things, we will have the answer. And if we don't, we'll know where to look for it. And we'll know how to communicate that in a way that sounds confident and in control. This question comes up often with people that uh, on the show is that is navigating the relationship if they're in the, the C-suite or the CEO. Sometimes it's with board members. Uh, other times it's with the team members who, and, and from a communication standpoint, I'd love to know this or just a negotiating standpoint. I'm not sure what term I should use here, but that board member or team member who thinks their way is always the right way. Oh, yes. Or, or even the the dreaded, well, that's the way we've always done it. Yes. Any, uh, I guess, tips on success that you've had navigating those type of relationships? <laughs> Challenging relationships happen all the time. Imagine if everyone was so easy and so <laughs> self-aware, we wouldn't really have to negotiate or have different difficult discussions. So when we are in the scenario that that happens and we have a personality, for example, that is more challenging, Asking questions, because if we can ask questions and get people to give us that feedback, not just this is the way it's done. This is the way it's always done. And I appreciate that. And it's taken us from there to here, which is wonderful. But what if we looked at a few different options? How would you see that? What would that look like? And oftentimes, people are going to need an outside voice, because if they are the boss, and they're used to just giving direction. Sometimes they need to participate in an exercise, which does give them a bit of 360, you know, feedback. And they can take and use that. So that that's an organizational tactic. Oftentimes, there are going to be situations, you know, we've all had bosses that we've worked for, me included, that you think, you know, if only they could just <laughs> see themselves for a moment. It would be very, very different. So listening, asking some great questions, putting out some ideas that maybe they're not going to agree with it right away. But oftentimes, especially leaders, they've gotten there because of the, their intellect and their experience. And they sometimes just need a little bit more time to ruminate on and think about what you've presented. So doing it in a non-threatening way, a, a way that makes it their idea is always a good starting point. Uh, one of the things, so for example, in meetings, we're going to have teams of people, we're going to have introverts and extroverts. Yep. And, and sometimes people a little bit of each, but mostly they're going to fall onto one side or the other. And oftentimes the extroverts take up all the air in the room and they can be the leader. They are doing all of the speaking, but the introverts have wonderful ideas. They just don't feel that they're ready to share those ideas because they feel intimidated or it's not their nature, whatever it is. A simple strategy that can shift that, and I recommend it all the time. So 
boardroom tables, you know, those long rectangular tables, usually the boss is sitting at the head of the table. What does that tell us? That tells us that they're the leader, they think they're the leader, whatever that is. If we mix things up about where we sit, because oftentimes, again, we're always going to sit in the same place. We won't show up at the meeting, we sit in the same place. (laughs) I encourage people to shift that around and the boss doesn't sit at the head of the table. They sit somewhere else and encourage and say, you know what, I've you know, creativity is enhanced, uh, ideas, I'm open to listening. Let's take turns sitting in these different places. And you want to try to maneuver the introverts to the head of the table. Because psychologically, they start to embody some of the things that we think about in that person who sits at the head of the table. So we'll get different ideas, we'll get more buy in of our ideas as a leader, just by sharing some of that. It, the, the word buy-in just completely sparked a, another question here for me. And, and that's that idea is like, as we're innovating, as we're moving forward, we talk a lot in credit unions, obviously, with technology and the pace of change. And, it, you know, mm-hmm. is the idea that we've got to keep moving forward to stay relevant with everybody that's kind of coming into our space. How do you like communicate buy-in through an organization, especially if the organization is larger where, you know, you may buy in? As the leader, your senior leadership team might be all in, but you need everybody to kind of buy in. Any tips on, I guess, that in in a world, no matter what profession or uh, industry we're in, that is moving very fast, seems faster than ever. Oh, it, and with AI now, you did yeah. that that's impacting and it's causing fear in some people, excitement in other people. <laughs> confusion for most of us. You know, there's a lot of things that are happening all around us. But buy-in happens, first of all, it starts with us. Trust starts with us. The buy-in starts with us. And when we can give concrete examples just through the way we're doing things, oftentimes it's like that pebble in the water. We see that ripple effect happening. So if we want it within our own credit union and we're now meeting uh, with people in a larger, uh, at the larger part of the organization, sharing just those small things. I always encourage people start with something small that everybody can buy into before you start going with these big grandiose ideas. Because for many people, depending on where they're at with their experiences, it can be tough to make that mental leap from where I am. When I first started policing, I was started policing when policing was very, very different than it is now. And they started to shift where they wanted to give people more ownership, more independence, more personal leadership. And it was scary for a lot of the officers who had been around for a long time. Like, it's a paramilitary organization. The boss is this, you do this. It is not questioned. These things happen. And to shift that culture took a long time, but it had to start with each individual sergeant and their platoon. And then it would go to the staff sergeant and all of the people from there. We had to actually see a little bit of it before we can believe in it. And I think that the small steps are the best. Before we move on to the you know the rapid fire questions and, and wrap up the show, because I want to be respectful of your time. Was there anything that you, you hoped I was going to ask you that I didn't? <laughs> oh, gee, I don't know. You know, there's, I get asked so many questions. I want to leave some fun for the people that we are going to be on the uh, Minicon with, because I'm looking forward to a lot of engagement. Just so people know, I, I play a game. So we're going to be playing a game good. on that virtual And I will let you know right now, there's 10 questions and I customize them for each group and nobody makes it to question 10, including former FBI agents. I've done, uh, I spoke at a a conference with 800 uh, military leaders. I've spoken, you know, obviously financial insurance, et cetera. So I want to have a little competition, a little fun. Uh, and yeah. people can come with their their competition hats on and have we're gonna it's all in fun and we all learn something uh and i bust a few myths i like to be a <laughs> myth buster on these things so uh, i like it maybe we'll have to put together a little giveaway as well or something so oh that would be fun <laughs> okay perfect i'm with you <laughs> right now lauren and linda are like what are you doing we don't have to do that no. um, <laughs> okay so with that just a little fun with the rapid fire you, the questions come rapid but your answers don't have to be so when was the last time either personally or professionally you were amazed 
Oh, well, that was this past April. My son, who just turned 20, well, he was 19 at the time, won a gold medal at the Junior World Ski Championships in wow. Sweden. So Congratulations he is currently to your son the world. To, to mom and Thank dad. Thank you. Wow. Yes. Oh, yeah. I was amazed because. He was not favored to win this race. So the fact that he did was incredible. That is truly amazing. Congratulations there. What's taken up the Pamela self-growth space? What are you, what are you working on? <laughs> oh, well, I'm doing a lot of deep dives into fortitude and insight. I'm fascinated by what gives somebody that edge. And because we hear so often, you know, it's hard. I don't want to do that. I don't want to. You know, I just give a quick example of people coming back to the workplace, for example, or doing the things that are more challenging. So what is it that can help us all increase our fortitude? And uh, I do a lot of deep dives on that. I'm I'm doing some research around that area. So it's been it's been great. So one of the things I found in myself and uh, others that, you know, leading an organization that can be consuming at times, you mentioned sleep and vacations and and things of that, often to the detriment of personal relationships. You've mentioned your son. Anything you've lived and learned that you could share with that future leader that might be listening to, you know, create some some balance in life? (laughs) Oh, you know, for me, it's all about routine. So for example, when my son was very small, a toddler, I was working in a busy office at the prosecutor's office. And one of the other prosecutors said, you know, we do something every Friday night called Pizza Island. And I thought, what is Pizza Island? Well, they would... Because you're busy and, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money to do these types of things. So she said, I'll pick up a pizza on my way home. We put blankets and pillows on the floor. The kids and my husband, I sit on the floor, we pick a movie and we call it Pizza Island. And it's just a fun, relaxing time. And my son is now 20. We still do Pizza Island when he's home every Friday. (laughs) And my my husband and I still do it when he's not home. I love that. We sit in comfortable chairs now. We don't sit on the floor anymore now that he's older, but we still call it Pizza Island. And we just get a pizza and we pick a movie. And every Friday that we are together, we do that. So habits, creating routines. routines, I love that. (laughs) What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? And do you remember who gave it to you? Oh, I, I, I'm sure I must have read it. I'm on a bumper sticker or I'd have heard it somewhere. But it's really around, you know, at the end of your life, people never say they wish they'd spent more time doing something they didn't like. So if you love your career, that's amazing. If you love travel, that's amazing. But how often are we doing those things in our personal or even professional lives that we just don't like? And I, you know, when I turned 50, I said, I'm not saying yes to things I don't like anymore. So those, those, gatherings where there's a ton of people I don't know and I'm going to spend four hours making small talk, I don't do that anymore. I prefer smaller groups where I get to actually learn about people and understand them. I get a little bit more on the introverted side. So for me, that's what I like. And I don't. I say no now to those other things. And I don't make excuses. I just say no. (laughs) Just no. I feel like that's something I I turned 50 last week actually but I, Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> thank you. But that's something a few years ago I kind of felt like I was just like, yeah, no no is a great answer. So No is a great <laughs> answer. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Don't have to tell why. Uh, so I, I dig this idea of like having a mission. You talked about loving your job or not loving your job. Do you have a like a personal mission statement or or something that makes you do what you do? I do. And I probably fail at it most times, but I just want my goal every single day. I journal first thing in the morning. Usually I I say there are times where I fall off, but my goal is to be a little bit better today than I was yesterday. That's it. Just a little bit. And that can be in any area. You know, we have these five areas in our world, our, our health, our, uh, which is physical, mental, or spiritual. And that includes giving back to the community, I think, relationships and our professional satisfaction, our financial security. I just want to get a little bit better. I won't do all five in a day, but if yep. I can do one or two, that's wonderful. And over time, and it's boring as anything. Like, I don't have exciting answer for you. My stuff's all pretty mundane and monotonous, but that's those little increments moving forward. The greatest album of all time. That one you can still oh. listen to from front to back. Oh, well, I have I got to have a tie. U2's War and Journey's Escape. 
And I guess that shows my age for sure. But <laughs> I can still put them in. Right there. Love them. <laughs> Absolutely. Is there something you're currently reading or a book that you've gifted over the years that you just think everybody should read? Oh, well, the, what I'm currently reading is Insight by Tasha Urich, which is a great book. And it's a lot about what we were talking about, self-awareness. And the one I think everyone should read and that I have given away on several occasions, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And I think it's very timely no matter what, because bad things are happening all the time. Some, you know, Depending on what you look at, you can think the world's on fire right now, or you can think everything is great. I, I think more negative than anything. But when we read his book and recognize that in the darkest, worst times in life, we still have personal agency to see good, see humanity and do things that make sense in our chaotic environment. So it, it, it's not a book for the faint of heart. You have to be in the right mind space to read. It's yeah, not a, yeah. a beach read, so to speak, but yeah. it is one that I encourage everyone to at least pick up once in their life. That, that was a book that in, I think, my junior or senior year of, at university, that was a book that was assigned for the entire, like during a semester for the entire student body to read. And a few years ago, I revisited it. I still had the original one because it was just mm -hmm. like, I remembered that affecting me so well. And it, it did yeah. the second time as well. So <laughs> great. great book. And one other quick one, The Outsiders, okay. because what my husband and I were in Oklahoma a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking there and I we did the tour of Essie Hinton's area that The Outsiders was filmed in that movie from the 80s. And if you are from Oklahoma and you have not gone to Tulsa, Oklahoma to see where the outsiders, and if you have a teenager, they need to read that book. They, they need Phenomenal to read that book. book. Who plays you in the movie or biopic of your life? Oh, geez. I, that <laughs> is a tough one. I don't, I would, of course, like to think it is some wonderful actress, but uh, I can't even begin to imagine. But, you know, it's funny. There, there could be a show about my background life with my husband. We're in talks right now about that. And I will be on a television show on the Discovery Channel this fall. So I play well, myself, exciting. but. You uh, play yourself, yeah. but. Yeah. I, well, you'll have yeah. to. Send us a link to that, too. We'll put it back in the show Absolutely. Notes, so. Thanks. <laughs> when, when you hear the word success, who's the first person that comes to mind and, and why? You know, I, I, I thought about this many different times, and I can't think of one person because of those five areas that we talked about. I think I would love to say that I would think of myself, but of course, I, I, I have the humility to not say that. I think, <laughs> but I, I wish people could see themselves and yeah. because success is subjective and we all have successes, but we're so focused on our mistakes. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to encourage your audience to look in the mirror, say it's them and figure out that one small thing they're going to do that day that is going to take them to the next level to reach their, their goals. I love it. Last question. Any final thoughts you'd like to share or ask of our listeners today? Well, I, I think I applaud you for being a part of the credit union community because there is no greater service than having members of a community come together and work toward financial goals and to know that there are people there to support them and help them because money is something we get uncomfortable talking about. We mm -hmm. feel awkward around it. <laughs> and, you know, we'll talk about any, some of the things people talk about in public now is always shocking to me, but <laughs> they don't talk about money. Yeah, we I'm feel funny. embarrassed, <laughs> we feel, you know, insecure, we try to exaggerate or underestimate. And I think credit unions really give people an outlet where they know that there is someone in there that has had the same background, the same experiences, the same challenges, maybe or even successes. And they have a local, uh, someone they can speak to that gets them because the situational awareness is built into credit unions. It's part of it. That's part of the mission statement. We're the, we are aware of our community. That's huge. That's right. <laughs> well, thank you again. That's it. That's uh, We're wrapping this up. I've so enjoyed this for you being on the show. And I can't wait to watch your presentation and play the game and everything at Minicon. So Wonderful. if people have additional questions, we'll link to your website. What's the best way to get a hold of you? LinkedIn, email? Oh, what's LinkedIn. Your, your LinkedIn, LinkedIn is <laughs> fantastic. I love that. I'm on I'm one, I scroll LinkedIn, which is usually fairly positive or people are celebrating professional right. things. That's, 
that's yeah. the social media I like. So I, I you'll find understand me on that LinkedIn. completely. So yeah. <laughs> well, we'll link to that as well in the show notes and the, the, the link to register for Minicon uh, as well. Well, thank you so much, Randy, for having me. And I'm looking forward to September and being a part of Minicon. We cannot wait. Thanks again. A few things before we go. Please make sure to check out our sponsor, Valera, in the show notes. Valera is the nation's premier payments credit union service organization and financial technology solutions provider. They're also a longtime supporter of the show and allowing me to have this much fun doing what I do. So please stop by and check them out. Please also subscribe to the CU Insight Experience on your favorite podcast player. We're on them all. If you're looking for a book mentioned on the show, like the one the panel mentioned, uh, that is a good one. If you haven't read that, you should. Uh, a quick Google the CU Insight Experience podcast book list and your next read can be on its way from Amazon. Last but certainly not least, I want to thank all of you for listening. Y'all rock. And I greatly appreciate each and every one of you. Be well, friends. 